Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank and Chase Commercial Term Lending, the Whitcoff Group, New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Greenberg Traurig, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, NA, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grubnight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Dominican Republic, industrial engineer, comes to the Bronx, Alexander's Bolton stationery store, printing penny saver. Now, nah, you know, I want to get into another business. Insurance brokerage, livery, politician, community leader, hostess community college. I have uh, Sierra Angeles. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. So in my short synopsis, I, I went over a lot of things about you. So tell me about how your family originally got here, got from Spain to the Dominican Republic. Well, it is known that um, a group of the Angeles family migrated uh, to the Dominican Republic in the early 1800s uh, in search for land um, and opportunities basically, and two brothers basically stationed uh, and, and set their families in the north region of the Dominican Republic, um, a small town called Villadrina, or Jose Contreras Moca, um, and basically started raising their families. They both divided at one point uh, because of um, race-related issues in the family, uh, and they said in different uh, sort of town, but um, I was born in that town. I was the only one in my family to be born in the town. Now, you had mentioned to me when we got together that your great-grandfather and grandfather <coughs> were like, uh, the great-grandfather was in plantation, coffee, and other areas, and uh, then you, your, your grandfather, he was like an entrepreneur, right? He was a, was merchant. a merchant. He was a merchant. He, he had a big warehouse where he will sell all kinds of products uh, alongside coffee, of course, uh, sweet stuff and uh, anything you can think of, uh, beans and anything that people from neighbor uh, towns will come in and purchase. And he was very well known in the community. The family was very well known uh, and respected uh, because of Papa Luis. Um, and he wanted, uh, he always wanted his family on Sundays, no matter where they live, they it, could live. To come visit, right? To come visit and have lunch with them. So it was a very good experience growing up. Now, what happened with uh, the dictator in the Dominican, Trujillo? Well, in, in, in the 30 years of Trujillo, many, many families were in fear, uh, especially if you had 
land or if you have anything that he might like, even your daughters and, 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 and young women. Um, the example of the Mirabals, um, movies have been, books and movies have been written about in the time of the butterflies. Um, and the same thing happened to my grandfather and my uncle um, because uh, there was uh, the story uh, goes as to my grandfather having a horse that was wanted by one of the brothers of Trujillo and um, he refused to sell it or to give it away to them. Uh, and at the end, in the next two weeks, um, he was killed. Right, you said in October 12th. It was actually October 12th, uh, El Dia de la Raza, Columbus Day, uh, October 12th, 1959. Now, Grandma moved here before or after that? Right after he passed away, uh, my aunt was here. She had married uh, one uh, gentleman from the Dominican Republic, very prominent, and they came for their honeymoon to New York. And they stood here, and later on, they brought my grandma here. Uh, your grandmother came here, and she, uh, she settled in Bushwick. She settled in Brooklyn right. and eventually purchased the purchased house. Purchased the home in Bushwick, in and she was involved. She worked in a factory with the plates. She worked in a factory uh, arranging plates uh, and uh, was able to save money um, to purchase her house. She wasn't used to renting. She basically abandoned uh, the, the home and the kids, you know, and basically the other family members took care of them. Um, some went on to college and some others were already married. Now, how did your mother meet your dad? Well, my mom and my dad met, um, although they were living in different towns. Uh, my father always wanted to uh, look, love, like my mother, and um, uh, my mother thought that my father was not too serious. And she asked him um, for the uh, engagement that he needed to marry by uh, uh, Sybil. And shortly after, a couple of months after, they got married by church and, uh, in 1961, 62. Now, grandmother was here by this time. That is correct. Right. And, and you said to me, because of the dictator in the Dominican Republic, your father really couldn't do plantation work or anything else. So then he had a Jeep. Right? The family had a Jeep, a Jeep Wrangler in those days uh, because the, the, the roads were very difficult, especially in the rain. And uh, instead of working the land um, in, in his prospects of getting married and having a family, so he took the Jeep and started transporting passengers so from he, the town to the city. In form of a livery, which later on... That is correct. Okay. So, so it's over there. Grandma's here. When does that come over? My dad came over a couple of years after in 1960, um, I believe it was 1969. Now, he came over in 69. Mom was still in the Dominican with you and your brother. And, and sister, my sister. Your correct. brother and your sister. And you said to me, one thing that was very important with your dad was education. He wanted the family to be educated. And for some reason, this young lady over here who's so heavily involved in the, in the livery business and the car service business became an industrial engineer. How, how did that happen? Well, my father, as a result of what happened, it, he always said that money comes and goes. But the only thing that nobody can take away from you is education. Nobody can take that away, no matter what. And you can take it anywhere. If, if something happens to your home and in, 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 in your land, it's, you can go anywhere and you can find work. Um, he emphasized in learning languages. He emphasized in us, uh, you know, educating ourselves, especially women, uh, because he saw the struggles of my grandmother who never worked in her life and had to come to a country that she did not know, um, not young, and had to change her, her age, uh, basically to have the ability to work because at that time everybody wanted young workers. Um, and so that really set on my head that, you know what, I better listen to my dad. Uh, my aunt was already an industrial engineer. Some of my cousins went to study abroad, um, Greek uh, uh, um, and also in France. Um, and we were in the Dominican Republic. My father never wanted us to come here. Although when I graduated, my brother and my sister 
we all wanted to be now, here. Now, before you came here permanently, had you come here to visit Grandma? Uh, we came, I came in three occasions, uh, in 1983, 1984, in the summer. Uh, I worked. Um, That's when you worked at Alexander's? I worked in Alexander's uh, in the as a cashier. Right. I was in my grandmother's in Grand Concourse on 163rd Street. And, and what, what about Bolton's? Then uh, I work on 1984, 85 actually, uh, I'm sorry, in um, a stationery store in 170th Street in Grand Concourse. And um, when I came, after I graduated in January 26, 1986, um, in Pucamaima, which is one of the colleges in, in the Dominican Republic, um, so then... Um, so how did you make the decision that you were going to leave the Dominican Republic in 86? Well, when I graduated, although my aunt was already working as an engineer, she was doing very well and she already married. Uh, the salary conditions were like really, really bad. Um, I was making 7,000 pesos a month, uh, which at that time it was more than basic minimum wage. Uh, teachers were making 3,000 pesos, 2,000 pesos. And I knew that I was not going to be able to li live, you know, the same standard uh, that I was sort of so accustomed to. So when you come to. over, you come over to live with Grandma? I came over not necessarily wanting to live with Grandma. But you ended up living. But I ended up living with Grandma because my dad uh, didn't want me or my sister uh, to be by ourselves. Uh, we ended up renting an apartment in Cabrini Boulevard in Washington Heights. Uh, my friend who was going to college and my sister and I, um, and um, that's when I got a job in uh, Bolton's with my previous experience uh, at the stationery store and also at Alexander's. Um, and we try to put ourselves to school. Grandma passes on and Dad comes here to sell the house, right? Well, Daddy and my mom um, decided to leave the United States in 1974 to be with us. They purchased another house. Um, and my little sister was born in 1976. And um, in 1986, my grandmother died. Um, and sort of, you know, the house was in my dad's name. Um, and they had to sell the house. And he had to come and sign the deed. And being that all the kids were here, except my little sister, uh, so he decided, she was 10 years old, uh, he decided to to come here. So and that's when the family moves up to the Bronx, the, like the, the full house, as we would say. The full house, uh, my worst fears came <laughs> because I was living, you know, sort of independent from my dad. I had a job. I was making $129 a week. That was in the printing company? Uh, that was, no, the printing company came after, but that was in Bolton's, and I was very proud. Um, I can only dream the day that I could make $500 a week. So, so now you're there. Dad moves in. Mom's here, too. Your brother's here, and, you, and your baby sister's over here. And you're, you're in the... Uh, Cabrini Boulevard or? I had to move with my dad. Okay. He wouldn't allow us to, to be by to ourselves. Be alone. No. So dad comes here and as I said earlier, dad was doing a car service, a livery car service in the Dominican. Yes. And he subsequently meets these guys, these 29 livery drivers who have a, 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 liver, a service, uh, a, a base of business where basically the car service, you know, it's a radio service where people would call and they, they were, it was like a shareholder and a cooperative. It was Riverside, right? In the early 1980s, the, the business of livery became, it started to become legal. Uh, the gypsies were starting to be legalized uh, because the radios were taken away from the yellows and were given to, to the livery. So it, it started to become a real business, you know, a, a legitimate recognized business in New York City. And having the experience that my father had, um, especially because in 1974, 
He purchased several cars in the Dominican Republic, and some of these guys that he met in New York were his previous drivers uh, and friends. So he had a livery service basically in the Dominican Republic? In the Dominican Republic with the packaging. Um, he used to uh, deliver packages for big businesses, uh, dealerships, and so on uh, to the capital he was of the Dominican the Dominican's Dominic example of Federal Express or UPS. That is correct. He will travel with one passenger or two passengers. Uh, very exclusive. Uh, my mom was helping as a secretary to the business, and um, in the trunk of the car, he will have all the packages that he needed to distribute. So he's here, and he and a couple, as you said, these drivers who were in the business before, they decide to start an entity called Riverside. Riverside Radio Dispatch. And basically, the radio dispatch business, the driver was paying $50 a, a week to get calls over there. Mm -hmm. So how does the industrial engineer daughter, Bolton's printing person, <laughs> get involved in the car service business? Now, mom was part of it, right? Um, well, when my dad passed away in 1993, after he invested some of the money. But before that, were you and your... I was in, in the business. I was working in the printing business as a production assistant and... Um, I was involved with, you know, color coding, the color printing in, in, so, so in the production. So 94, Pop passes on. 93. 93, and there's a, he owns shares in this company. Uh, it was one of 29 shareholders. But he was really running, it sounds, more because of his expertise on the business. But you said the, the company really had other avenues also. Yes. Uh, I never knew that a livery car service also had a travel agency. Mm -hmm. They had a restaurant in the, in the place. So they were serving, you know, they, they were making sandwiches, uh, you know, and they were making travel reservations around because there was no internet to speak of. There were no, uh, you know, Expedia or other things. So they were really in a, a multi-purpose. Riverside was more than that. Yes, um, they were very, uh, they had a, a big vision. My father had a huge vision about how the business was supposed to grow. And they started investing in a travel agency um, and they became members of the IATA. They had everything set up. And they also felt that they had an opportunity to make money as well by servicing the drivers with, you know, and their wives that will come and the families and have a great dinner, um, as well as lunch and specials and all that kind of stuff. And my father was running the restaurant. Uh, but when he passed away in 1993, suddenly, uh, basically, we were faced with um, the, the decision. Right, and, and then subsequently, a couple months later, the family had another tragedy because your brother, was he was running the bodega? My brother used to have a meat market uh, called La Antillana, and um, he went to a store, to a friend's store, and apparently there was a holdup, uh, and as a result of it, uh, he lost his life. And he had a 12-day-old daughter at that time. That so. is correct. So dad's pass on, your brother passes on. This is a little difficult. The business is a little over there. So the industrial engineer decides to get involved with the car service or the entire operation because it wasn't a car service. It was a livery service. It was a restaurant business. It was a travel agency. But then you decided to even enhance it more. How do you decide that there was a need to go into the insurance brokerage business for this business? Well, not knowing the industry, not knowing exactly what I was getting myself into, my mom called me and said, I need your help. Uh, basically, uh, up until that point, I had left everything to my brother to sort of help my mom. Uh, but in, in, in the event that my brother wasn't there, nor my father, uh, it was all girls. So I had to step up. My sister was ready to go to college. And um, I had to make a decision. My husband, uh, by then I was married and with a child, five years old. And my husband was in the bodega stores. Um, we had two, um, one in First Avenue and 106 and another one in 193 in Broadway. And we, I had to really step up and help mom. But how do you have the vision about the insurance aspect of the business? Well, uh, when we were faced with the decision, I, I saw the agency. Uh, I started looking into the news. 
um, in the separation of the industry, there was two things happening. The dot coms were, were really coming into play, the internet, the web. Um, and I started to see how people will no longer need the assistance of a travel agency. Uh, and what was a, 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 a very good business at that point uh, could eventually deteriorate basically because it, it did not represent that kind of sort of service business. Right, which, which we will talk on in a little while because of your active role as the spokesperson for the livery business because of the Ubers and the other That is services. correct. And, and, and so... Uh, because if you look at the, 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 the time period, what happened to the travel agency is happening to the car business. Literally. That is correct. Technology has changed basically how the job market um, has evolved in, in not only in the United States, but I think in the world. Transportation is different. And so at that time, I think uh, it redefined. It, it redefined the automotive industry uh, in the factories because you had more technology that was incorporated to the jobs. And therefore, the needs for, for the human labor was no longer... Uh, right, but, but as you said to me, there was a need that... Basically, the drivers, they, they weren't aware of the, uh, the insurance implications. They weren't really good operations out there. There were many fly-by-night small brokers who really didn't take care of the coverage. And when a driver had an accident, they could have lost everything. So it was That is correct. Uh, there was also a need that was present as well. I was always involved in community work in the Dominican Republic. And I think coming in here and looking at Hispanic drivers, uh, for the most part, that did not know the language, that did not know how to navigate the system, uh, were faced with people that were not so honest. And also um, that I also saw how other businesses started to spread around. And, and perhaps I, I had an opportunity to reinvent the business. And instead of going into the travel agency in a multi-service kind of agency, which is very common in New York City, I decided to specialize in something that could give back, give back to the same drivers. Right. Now, so you went in LA Riverside was the insurance brokerage even though you and mom uh, and the family owns a piece of Riverside. That is correct. Car service, you dedicated yourself more into the auto insurance aspect over there. Yes, I, we decided to concentrate in catering to the industry in the, in the insurance side of it. So, so how did you one day decide that there was a need for this outspoken young Dominican lady to be the spokesperson for the livery car service business? Well, we started raising awareness since 1998 when the insurance crisis came in into New York City and only one carrier was able to stand uh, American Transit Insurance Company and others left the market. And so ever since then, I felt I had a responsibility to give back to the people who actually supported uh, my ideas, my crazy ideas at that time. When other issues started to arise um, also in trying to protect the integrity of the basis that my dad created in, in his driver's friends that were still there, I had to become a serious advocate and learn the business in, in, in the TLC too. But, but I mean, you became such a serious advocate that you did a couple of things. One is, when did you decide you wanted to be a radio celebrity? and spend your Saturday afternoons from 3 to 4 explaining insurance, explaining the TLC and everything, and going on WALD. When was that? Since 2008, things have started to change. Workers' compensation, livery fund. Um, there was a lot of regulations that were updated in New York City um, because of the TLC started to look more into the liveries. And so a lot of the drivers were finding out these regulations because they were summonsed. And in 2009, the, the rules, all the rules were revised and the accountability rules came in and they were gonna be implemented in different phases. I felt it was my responsibility at that time um, to at least uh, tell them what was happening and bring the people who were making laws and who were changing uh, sort of the, 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 um, the business uh, right before us and, and, and hold them accountable. How do you decide that you wanted to legitimatize the livery business that they were able to be pick up people 
on a fair basis out of the outer boroughs because of the lack of cars over there. Well, TLC... Start- As we would say, the, the green car. It's, it's the apple green. Apple green. Uh, they started to, like I said, uh, uh, looked into deliveries more. And as, as enforcement came in and we saw that we at one point have 5,000 summonses in our hands and there was no option. And um, other mayors tried to do it before. I participated in some of the requests to, to legalize the boroughs. Uh, many ways were tried and nothing worked. And I felt that at that point we have earned the right after several decades uh, to, to define what was to happen in, in the boroughs. And that our drivers should not be penalized in a way of doing it legally without interrupting now, the now, yellow but, system. But I don't want to interrupt the yellow system, but now a driver, a livery driver, was had, had the opportunity to drive into Manhattan, pick up a cab, you know, north of 96th Street or in Queens or any of the boroughs and bring a person to Manhattan on a fair basis uh, by a meter and pay only $3,000 as opposed to the cost of a medallion, which was close to a million dollars. Well, but the money you make, what we try to do was to just legalize the portion of our industry that was not legal. Our drivers sustain themselves from the prearranged and also from picking up on the street. And they don't make the same money that the yellow cab driver makes. And, and as we all know, it's not only the residents of the central district, but you also have the visitors of New York City, which we know um, is, is very substantial. What they make is totally and completely different. And therefore, the TPEP was the one who defined the zones and, and what was defined as the central district. And basically, the areas that they were not serving, so then it was sort of recognized. So how many apple green cars are there today on the street? Today we have approximately 8,000. We are in the second emission. Out of the second emission, the the TLC has sold 2,000. There's still 1,000 of them that have not been ready or equipped. They have uh, three months, um, 90 days, in some cases up to six months, depending if it's a wheelchair vehicle. So, so in addition to this, you know, since you have so much free time, when did you decide to go back to school? And, and today you're having your final exam and you're going to be graduating. Well, that was a dream. That was something that I wanted to do. Uh, my priorities have changed. It's no longer engineering anymore. Um, I think is uh, public administration is is more knowing the system. So you're getting your bachelor's in uh, in arts and public administration from Fairleigh Dickinson from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and I think it's important that um, I learn more so that I know basically. And, and, and you feel that you you're going to go for your master's? You want to go? I am. You have a son. He's what 26 now. My son is 26. And what is he doing? My son is going to law school. And um, he wants to be uh, constitutional law and litiga- litigation. And, and mom is still with you at the liveries, uh, with the brokerage business? My mom still comes to the business. Uh, she actually is the one who runs it, um, like in the money side of it. I do the marketing. I'm out there. I'm with the basis and the drivers. Um, I concentrate in the advocacy part. I work with the TLC, the Commissioner Yoshi. Um, in the leadership, basically, and look at legislation locally and at the state level. So the, 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 the little industrial engineer, you know, who came over here, who worked Alexander's, Bolton's, you know, the stationery store, uh, and it was truly become the advocate for the livery car services, or a.k.a. the spokesperson. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here and only continue on growing and getting better and better. Well, it is my hope to continue to contribute to New York City and what makes New Yorkers, I think, it's, it's, it's just be- beautiful because we all come from different backgrounds and we are able to be successful and make it here and um, it's all what you want to do. Thank you.